Let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50. We all have a great problem. And we need to think about that because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 50, that there's something ahead for us. And we're in the midst of our study on lessons and living at the end of days. We're walking through the seven letters to Christ's church. And the next slide, it gives us our text, and that's what we're going to look at this evening. 1 Corinthians 15, 50, and I'll read it for you, says, Now I say this, brethren, Christians, brothers and sisters, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Do you think about that? Our problem is we can't get to heaven like we are right now. Something has to change. These bodies can't go to heaven as they are. That is one of the profound reasons why Paul said, I desire to depart. I want to die. Why? Because he says, I want to get to heaven. And this body, as it is right now, can't go there. And what we need to think about is, since we all have to either die and this, this sown in corruption body be put in back to the dust from which it came, or else be raptured into Christ's presence. But we can't get to heaven like we are. So the question is, are we going to be ending well? And that's what I want to study with you tonight, ending well. Well, this evening, death is 77.6 years away from every child at birth collectively. That's how long people live in America, 77.6 years. So you can count in your mind, I'm, I guess, about 30 years from 77.6, and some of you are over. <laughs> and uh, we're all in between there. How are we going to do at ending well? We really aren't ready to live until we're prepared to die. We live best when we know what counts when we die. And along that line, I've enjoyed studying through the scriptures, the endings of God's saints. After the Lord got a hold of my life, as I mentioned a few years ago, uh, in, or a few minutes ago, in 1975, I began reading the Bible through three times the New Testament and twice the Old Testament every year. And I've done that for 28 years. And each time I read through, I look for something different. And one of the times I went through every page of this book, I looked for the endings, how God's saints ended their lives. And this evening, I'd like to spend some time with you studying that through the eyes of the Smyrnans, because the fascinations of the Smyrnans is, we'll see in our text this evening, 2, 8 through 11 of Revelation, if you want to turn there, that the Smyrnans, the, the people of the church of Smyrna, had to learn about ending well. And the scriptures are, are filled with lessons on how to suffer and die triumphantly. And that's what they had to learn. They had to learn how to, to suffer, how to die triumphantly. And I want you to think deeply with me tonight about how you want to finish life on planet Earth. Since none of us know when that's going to be, we can prepare what that's going to be and how that's going to be for the glory of God. We don't know when. We don't know when our appointment. It says in the Scripture, it's appointed on to man and woman and child once to die. And after that... For the lost, the judgment. After that, for us who are saved, the judgment of what we did in our lives, whether it was uh, good or good for nothingness. But once, an appointment to die. We don't know when that appointment is. I do know that on Friday night, it was Buck Crane's appointment, and Jesus met him. In fact, I told his family that. I said, I know where Jesus was at 620 Friday. He was right here. Because he took him through the valley of the shadow of death, personally, himself. But you and I, we don't know when that will be, but God has allowed us to choose how that will be. And we should start making preparations. We should start looking at how to live at the end of days on this planet as well as our own. And in Revelation 2, as we stop at these ancient ruins, at these stones of God's remembrance in Smyrna, we have found a beautiful site. The next slide is one of my favorite places in all the the land of the Bible, and that's this archwayed entrance to the Forum of Smyrna. And whenever I see this picture, it, it speaks to me of ending well. How to suffer and die triumphantly. I don't mean so much uh, at the stake. Uh, most of us will suffer and die at home and the hospital, probably not in the arena or at the stake or uh, being torn apart by bullets or whatever. But most of us will just have a normal death. 
but we still need to know how to suffer, go through the deprivation and loss of our mobility, our comfort, our security, our health, uh, our time, deprivation of sleep, all the things you can think of. We have to know how to suffer through that. And then when that moment comes, how to die triumphantly. Well, the next slide takes us to Revelation 2.10. I want you to turn there with me. Revelation 2.10, if you're already in Revelation 2, get to the 10th verse. And we're going to spend this evening looking actually only at this verse and, and a little bit uh, at the first half and then a, a little bit at the second half. But 2.10 reminds us of this. Do not fear any of those things which are about, you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Hmm. You know what he's saying? The, the admonition here is, look out, trouble's coming. Now, I can promise you trouble's coming. Uh, either your medicine is going to cost more, or you're going to you know, not have as much for retirement as you thought about. Uh, maybe you're going to have increasing difficulty from your neighbors or relatives or friends. Uh, probably in America, uh, there is going to be a decreasing economic prosperity, although uh, it does seem the tribulation is marked by uh, great prosperity, and so the time before the tribulation might be prosperous. So I, I'm not a, a foreteller of the future, but the Bible says all who live godly in Christ Jesus will what? Suffer. Right? So we know we're going to suffer, and we need to watch out. Well, the next slide reminds us of the ten days. Uh, one way of looking at this are the ten successive persecutions that faced. And, and the first major persecution, which was uh, sporadic and local in church history terms, was under Nero. And I'm going to show you in a little while a picture of him. But Nero, for 14 years, following him, the second uh, uh, persecution was provincial. Uh, Nero just swamped around Rome and places like that and, and did some sporadic things. His uh, successor, Domitian, that's who exiled John, pro province by province persecuted the church. I mean, it was, uh, it was like uh, the Roman province of Asia or Bithynia or wherever. He, he systematically, and then later on, the last one down there, Diocletian, it was empire-wide persecution, as I told you last week. He destroyed every complete copy. There's no extant copy of God's Word that's complete in one place, in one uh, complete scroll. Of course, there are many pieces, and we have all of the Bible, but he destroyed every complete copy. But Nero, Domitian, Trajan, Marcus Aurelius, Septimus Severus, Maximus, uh, Decius, Valerian, Aurelian, and Diocletian, 10 days. Next slide. I want to, to remind you of uh, where we're headed. This, this picture is Izmir, and you can see it on any USA Today map of Turkey. You'll see Izmir right there. That's Smyrna of, of the Bible times. And right in the center of town, that little green spot you see there uh, with the arrow pointing at it is where I keep showing you those entrance. But the early church did indeed have those ten great persecutions. And each one of them, until Constantine's Edict of Toleration, seemed to get worse. And those people had to learn how to suffer and how to die triumphantly. You know, the pathway to true discipleship begins when a person is born again. It begins when a succession of events take place. We realize that we're sinful, lost, blind, and naked for God. That, those were wonderful testimonies tonight, weren't they? What a blessing. Uh, to testify. You know, the word testify is marturion, is, is a person who witnesses, who testifies of Christ, from which we get the English word martyr. So you guys better watch out. You testify so well. Maybe the Lord will have you testify even further. All of us should be living marturions for the Lord. Secondly, when we acknowledge we cannot save ourselves by good character, good works, then we believe the Lord Jesus died as our substitute, and then we by faith acknowledge Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's salvation. But at this ancient Roman forum of Smyrna, martyrs walked to their deaths. They were sent to their deaths by the power of Rome, directed by the emperors of Rome. There were 57 emperors who ruled the Roman Empire, one after another. And of those emperors, 10 of them, which I showed you the names briefly, 10 of them were terrible advocates of persecution against God's church. And as they sat upon the throne of Rome, they instigated these persecutions using the full power and might of the Roman Empire. 
Domitian, one of those on that list I showed you, was on the throne as John was writing this letter from Christ to the church in Smyrna. And these men held the power of the world in their hands. They commanded the nearly invincible, legendary legions of Rome, who not only conquered the world, but built this road system in their wake, which made the Roman world the most connected world since uh, from ancient times until now, there was no time quite like them until modern days. But what I'd like to just take a moment to think with you, these men who persecuted, who had wealth and riches flowing like rivers into their imperial coffers, how did they die? I mean, have you ever thought about that? These men who inflicted death on God's people, these men who witnessed the triumphant suffering and death of God's saints, for just a moment, think about how they died. Okay, next slide will remind us of that. Here's a, four guys that you all know from the Bible. Uh, up on the upper left corner is, is uh, Octavius Augustus Caesar. I mean, that's, that is Augustus, the one that called the census in Christ's time. And then over here is Tiberius. He was sitting on the throne when Christ was crucified on the cross. Over there is Trajan. He's one of those persecutors. And right here is the bad guy. Nero, the first of the persecuting emperors. Most of us have at least heard of those four, the 57. Let me read to you briefly how these men came to their ends. In fact, uh, this is from a sermon of a, a Baptist preacher in London you've heard of, Charles Spurgeon. This is what he said. Of the 57 Roman emperors and other governors of provinces and high office who distinguished themselves by their zeal and bitterness in persecuting the early Christians... This is how they ended. It's amazing. We're talking about ending well. Here's how the men who ran the world ended. And I'll just give you the, the ones who, who we know by name that I just listed off. One became speedily deranged after an atrocious cruelty. In other words, they, they horribly persecuted and tore apart someone, and it made him go crazy because it overwhelmed him. Uh, one of them was slain by his own son. One became blind. The eyes of one started out of his head. In other words, they started coming right out of his head. And it probably was some uh, high blood pressure thing, but he came out and then he died. One was drowned. One was strangled. One died in miserable captivity in prison. One fell dead in a manner that cannot bear recital. I'm not sure what Spurgeon meant by that. These all sound awful to me. One died of so loathsome a disease that several of his physicians were put to death because they could not abide by the stench of his rotting body while he was still alive that filled the room. Can you imagine that? They had no surgery like we do and no anesthesia, and this guy rotted to death, one of these Roman emperors, uh, and they executed the physicians because they wouldn't stand there and smell it and help him. Mm. Two of them committed suicide. A third attempted suicide, but didn't do it well enough, so he called for help to finish himself off. Five of them were assassinated by their own people or servants. Five others died the most miserable and excruciating deaths. Several of them had untold complications of disease and were killed in battle or after being taken prisoner. And so ends the litany of their death. But listen to this. Among these was Julian the Apostate. The days of his prosperity when he was Roman emperor and Julian uh, the apostate was, was uh, after the, the uh, religio licita, or licita, which was the legalization by Constantine. He was even after that. But in the days of his prosperity when he was emperor, it was said he pointed his dagger. He pulled out his Roman dagger toward heaven. He defied the Son of God, whom he commonly called the Galilean. So he knew about Jesus, didn't like him, and he pulled out his dagger as emperor and put his head up. And he said, I defy you uh, to do anything to me. I'm the Roman emperor. It's not a wise thing to do. He was wounded soon after in battle. He saw that all was over with him. And as he lay on the battlefield, historians record that he gathered up his clotted blood. He was bleeding to death. He gathered up a handful of it and threw it up in the air. And he said, Thou hast conquered, O Galilean. And he died. Not very good ways to die, these men. So it has been throughout history, and it will be to the end. Not a very pretty picture. Not a very nice ending. Because only Jesus can take the sting out of death. And that's exactly what he promised these people to do. He said, Smyrnans, I want you to end well. And the most important decision we'll ever make in life is how we want to die. And the saints in Smyrna wanted to die in Jesus. Next slide reminds us of Polycarp. 
You remember his testimony? He was the pastor of this church. He was martyred on Saturday, the 23rd of February, in A.D. 155. The proconsul gave him a choice, curse Christ or be burned. And he made those memorable words. He says, 80 and 6 years, I have served my Lord Christ. How can I deny him now? And he died well. He stayed at the stake unbound until the fires consumed his life. And from this very walkway, he walked up to that stake in that forum that's right through to the right after you get to the the little uh, patch of stone there and turn to the right, it goes up into the forum. From there, his spirit rose safely into the arms of Jesus. Polycarp died a martyr. For the faith of Jesus Christ. It's not easy to be a Christian in Smyrna. It's not easy to be a Christian today. But the letter to the Smyrnans is one of the two in which there's undiluted praise. Because Jesus loves those who will be his witnesses. Even witnesses to death. But all of us should be willing to be a witness to our last breath. And that's what I want to challenge you for tonight. Next slide reminds us about martyrdom. Remember the the historic reasons in church history that pastors have encouraged saints during the years of persecutions to, and this is what they're doing in Pakistan today and in all the places you read about in the Voice of the Martyr magazine, where they're still burning them and beating them in India, burning them alive in their cars and stuff. What historically the church has taught them is, we're not our own, right? First Corinthians 6, well, you're not your own, you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. So why should we be willing to be martyrs? We don't belong to ourself. Number two, we're, we're dying anyway, right? We're all dying. Uh, from the moment of our birth, we start toward death. So why not be willing to die? And what better thing to do with our life than to die for him? And remember, losers are keepers. If we hold on to our life, we lose it. But if we give it up to him, we gain it forever. And so those are some of the historic reasons we should think about. The next slide takes us back to verse 10. Look at the second half of Revelation 2.10. Uh, The admonition was, bad times are coming, but the appeal is this. The end of verse 10 says, be faithful unto death, Jesus said, and I will give to you the crown of life. I think that's a twofold promise. Part one, be faithful till you go to the stake, to the pit, to the prison, to the guillotine, to the firing squad, to be stoned or dragged or whatever. That's martyrdom. Or be faithful to death. Never stop confessing Christ. No matter how much you suffer. No matter how bad life gets. No matter how it turns out that you're alone and unsought and unloved and unvisited. Be faithful all the way to death. So there's really two ways we can look at this. This appeal is not just for those that are going to be burned at the stake. Jesus said, I will personally give you A crown of life. Faithful in this verse literally means to be convinced. He says, be convinced of me. Believe that Jesus, as Revelation 1.5 says, is a faithful witness. Believe he is so faithful that we as saints are so convinced of that, that we rest on him, depending on what he says. We're convinced of him, that he's worth living for to death. He said, if you do that, I'll give you a crown of life. And unless Christ returns soon, All of us face the inevitability of death. The question tonight is, are we ready? Have we planned how we want our lives to end? So many get to the funeral arrangements and their life insurance in order, but they don't plan and prepare for how to end well. Let's start that tonight by looking at these biographies. The next slide is where we ended last time, and I want you to, to go with me to Genesis 47:29, and I want you to mark these. I just alluded to them last week, and, and I'm going to plow into them this week. This is the beginning of my study many years ago of how God's great saints ended, and I actually read all the way through the Bible and found all the death scenes and all the endings. Here is one of seven that I picked out for you tonight. And it's Jacob's life, and uh, the point of Jacob's life is he trusted the promises of the Lord to the end. And if you're going to plan out your life, I hope you plan tonight, you're going to trust God's promises all the way to the end. What do I mean by that? Well, chapter 47 of Genesis, verse 29. First point, he looked for the land of promise all the way to the end of his life. It says in 47, 29, when the time drew near that Israel must die, Israel is the, the name that God gave to Jacob when he renamed him uh, at the brook Yabbok when he wrestled with him, when 
Israel or Jacob must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, Now if I found favor in your sight, please put your hand under my thigh and deal kindly and truly with me. Please do not bury me in Egypt. Verse 30, But let me lie with my fathers. You shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And he said, I will do as you've said. And he said, Swear to me. You know what? He said, I want to die and be placed in the land of promise. You know, that's something. He was a man of faith. Egypt was much nicer than Canaan. I mean, his son was the viceroy, the vice regent. He was the big man. I'm sure that, that Jacob got to live in, in unrivaled splendor because he was the son, or his son. He was the father of the, the great viceroy. But, you know, that didn't get to his heart. He says, I'm looking for the land of promise. And that land of promise was connected by God to that land of Canaan. And he said, I want my body taken back there because that's what I'm trusting. I'm trusting the promises. Yeah, look at chapter 48, verse 15. Here's another aspect of his life. Secondly, he not only looked for the land of promise all the way to the end. Chapter 48, verse 15 of Genesis, he followed his shepherd the good shepherd, all the way through his life. It says in verse 15, Then he blessed Joseph, and he said, May the God before whom my father Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day. You know what he says? He says, My life, with all its failures and all its deceptions and all its sins and, you know, all my lapses as a good dad and everything else, which all of us can, can identify with, he says, Yet I followed the shepherd. Ever since I met him at Bethel, when he saw the Lord and the Lord revealed himself, he would go back to Bethel and remind himself who he belonged to. And what I see in this 15th verse is he followed his shepherd all the way. And I've been following my shepherd for 41 years. I heard Royce 50-some years. He shared his testimony yesterday morning with someone. And many of you even longer. But I hope that we trust the Lord's promises and follow our shepherd all the way. Look at verse 16. He trusted his Redeemer to care for his sin. You know, a lot of people on their deathbed, they're, they're so concerned. They're, they're wondering if, you know, they get a little bit uh, concerned, kind of like Roman Catholic, that they need a little extreme unction, you know, in case they missed any. And I remind them, and, and we should preach the gospel to ourselves, what it says in the 16th verse. Uh, the angel who has delivered me from all harm, may he bless these boys, may be, the, be called by the name of the names of the father, uh, their father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may they increase greatly on the earth. What he was talking about there was that it is the Lord, verse 16, who redeemed me from all evil. That word is actually redeemed. Uh, he was, um, the deliverance is a redemption. He says, I am trusting my redeemer to care for my sin. I can't take care of even one of them, so I have to trust him to take care of all of them. Right? So how do you trust the promises of the Lord to the end? You look for the land of promise. You realize this isn't our home. You follow your shepherd, and that's what we should do, and trust his redemption. Well, let's go to chapter 50 and look at the next one of our heroes, his deathbed. And that's the testimony of Joseph. Joseph is going to be in uh, chapter 50 in verse 24. And The testimony of Joseph is this. His life ends with him pointing to the faithfulness of God. So we should, first of all, be trusting the promises. The first way I want to die is trusting God's promises, and I hope you do too. That's where you start. That's where Jacob was. But don't just stop there. Remember, we should plan this out. We should plan, secondly, to be like Joseph, to point to God's faithfulness in our life. Verse 24 of chapter 50, And Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land, to the land he promised on oath to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Joseph, as he was dying, was pointing to God's faithfulness. He says, he says God has always been faithful, and I want you to also trust his faithfulness. Whenever I think about Pointing to God's faithfulness. I think of Howard Smith, my friend, when I was at Grace Community Church for those years on staff at Grace. I watched over the senior citizens and I buried them one a week. I had a funeral every week, at least one a week. And I, that's why I love funerals. I mean, it's just, it just, to me, it's a celebration because these were saints. And Bonnie and I would visit them. And Howard and Carolyn we used to love to go to their house there. And, and what a sweet couple. Howard was 96 memorizing scripture to the last day he was alive and able to still memorizing verses and i'll never forget we were in there with carolyn and and uh, he was uh laying there in bed 
uh, he died at home, wonderful way to die, and he was there, you know, just barely breathing. You know, hadn't opened his eyes for two days. And she said, why don't you read him some of his favorite verses? And I said, well, you can't hear me. She said, oh, read him anyway. Carolyn said that, his wife. And so I said, okay. And so I do this when I read with the kids. You know, sometimes I leave out verses so we can get through it faster, you know. And so I was reading along, and uh, I said, uh, and I was reading, and I skipped a couple of verses. And I was watching his mouth while I was reading, and it was kind of moving as I was reading. And all of a sudden he'd go, he was listening. I'd left out a verse, and he would go, and I thought, you're supposed to be in a coma. What are you doing listening to me? And I realized that even though his body was falling apart, his spirit, he was still conscious. And he knew those scriptures so well, his favorite ones, that when I left part of it out, you know, he, he visibly moved. Well, I finally didn't leave anything out, and he stopped moving, and we went into the kitchen. And we shouldn't have. I should have known. We were talking to Carolyn, and all of a sudden, we heard, Hallelujah! And he had sat right up in bed, put his arms out, and fallen straight forward like that. I mean, amazing. He died pointing to the Lord. Not sure. Maybe, you know, he saw the Lord as he came to get him. I think about that when I read about Joseph. He died pointing to the faithfulness of God. What do you point to? Turn back to Genesis 41, verse 51. Here's one thing that Joseph never stopped pointing to. And, I, and it's, a, it's a reminder for us. If you and I want to have our life end in, in a triumphant way, we should, we should point to God's faithfulness. That's why it's so important. And, and I practice this all the time with the children. I keep having them retell. Uh, they have their spiritual birthday every year, and they, they retell how they came to know Jesus Christ. It gets better every year. You know what I mean? Their testimonies get better every year, the older they get. And then Bonnie and I retell the stories of God's faithfulness in our lives. We, we tell stories, usually one every night, just one point of how God blessed on a missionary trip or how God blessed this or how this prayer answered or how he led us together or something like that. What did Joseph point to? One thing, Genesis 41, 51, he pointed to God's faithfulness as he gave his past abuse to the Lord. Joseph was abused. He was abused as a son. He was abused as a brother. He was abused as a worker. He was abused as a friend. He was one of the most abused people in history. Look, look at his solution in Genesis forty-one fifty-one. He called the name of his firstborn Manasseh. God made me forget all this awful stuff, my toil in my father's house and all my abuse. And we would be well served to do the same. Not to relive it. Not to, you know, the new counseling techniques are to vent it and let it out. God's solution is forget it by his grace. Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind. I count them, but rubbish. They're only going to pollute my life. Joseph pointed to God's faithfulness because he gave his past abuse, all of the abuse he got in his life. He gave that to the Lord. Look at the next verse. Secondly, he gave his future plans to the Lord. What a wonderful thing. He says, God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. He wasn't oblivious to problems. He just gave his future plans to the Lord. He says, you are better at running my life than I am. And look what the Lord did with him. The Lord made him a type of Jesus Christ. I mean, Joseph is a beautiful picture in the Old Testament of Jesus Christ. Uh, he was betrayed by his brethren. He, he was taken and, and raised to the highest place by God's grace. Uh, just a beautiful, and I, I could go through all the typological and beautiful pictures, but basically he gave his future plans to the Lord. And he died pointing to the faithfulness of God. Let me start on the last one before we go. Uh, next slide is about David. The testimony of David, and if you want to turn to 1 Kings 2 with me. 1 Kings, and I just want to get you there for those of you that, that uh, want to read this and prepare your hearts. 1 Kings chapter 2, and I'm going to read the first four verses. Because David's life ends with him exhorting his family to follow God. If you want to make plans about how you want to go, plan tonight that you want to die trusting the Lord. Plan tonight that you want to end pointing at Jesus' faithfulness in your life. So start, start remembering it. Start recording it. That's what the Jews did. They always talked about God's faithfulness in the wilderness and feeding them and conquering the land. And That's why they have all those feasts, the Passover and, and on through the, the whole religious year, to remember God's faithfulness. And we should do the same. But thirdly, we should exhort our family to follow the Lord. Listen to what David did. And, and this is such a picture of his ending of his life. When the time drew near, verse 1 of 1 Kings 2, for David to die, he gave charge to Solomon his son. 
He called him in and said, I've got something I want to say to you. You know, we're so concerned. We get the lawyer and, and, and all that's important. And we get the will, we get the durable power, and we get the whatever that medical thing is, the living thing, and we, we work on that. We get our trusts and we... But have you really thought about the... I mean, money is money and it's stuck here unless you've sent it ahead to heaven. Have you thought about the spiritual bequest you're going to make? Pass on. And, and have you thought about who's going to be there to get it? I mean, and so David called uh, his beloved Solomon, his son. He said, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. And he said, so be strong. Show yourself a man. Observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in his ways. Here, this is David's testimony of his life. That's why he was a man after God's own heart. He's just reiterating what he probably told Solomon over and over again. But I just think it's so beautiful. Walk in his ways. Keep his decrees and commands, his laws and requirements, as is written in the law of Moses, so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go, so that the Lord may keep his promises to me. If your descendants watch how they live and they walk faithfully before me with all their heart and soul, you'll never fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. Wow. Now, David has three last words. This is just one of them. We're going to look at the rest later, but think about this. If the Lord calls between now and next Sunday, are you like Jacob? Are you trusting right now in the promises of God? Are, are you like Joseph? Are, are you pointing to God's faithfulness? Do you see it and do you point others to it? Do, is it hard to hold it in? And finally, are you like David and his testimony? Are you exhorting your family to follow the Lord? I was, I don't remember who I told this yesterday, but I said, ever since the children were little, I taught them to pray, I love you, Lord, and I want to serve you, Lord. And, and even before they know what those words mean, it's ingrained on their heart. I know, it was at the wedding reception last night, I met someone, I said, what are you going to do with your life? And they said, I don't know. I said, you better know, you should know you're going to serve the Lord. You can serve the Lord as an accountant or serve the Lord as a, as a, a broken arrow you know, sanitation department person, you know, or you can be the president, but you should serve the Lord. Right? That's pointing your family to follow the Lord. Well, we're going to pick up with David next time. Let's bow before our Lord and let's commit to him that we want to end well and that we want to serve him all of our days. Father in heaven, you've told us in your word that you have an appointment set for us. We don't know when that is, but we know how we want to be. We want to die trusting. We want to die exhorting those around us to follow you and pointing to how faithful you've been. And I pray we'd make plans right now. Plans that, that we're going to be exhorting our families. I know that, that many in this fellowship are so busy and, and so active for you and so fervent in their work, but if they neglect the exhortation from your word of their families, husbands of their wives, wives of their husbands, parents of their children, then it really doesn't matter if they have the best class or ministry in the church because they're going to fail at home. And so I pray that we would make sure that we are exhorting those closest to us by our personal prayers for them and our personal input into their lives, exhorting them, pointing them to your faithfulness, pointing to their need of trusting you with their lives, putting all of our past into your hands and trusting our plans for the future for your fruitfulness in our lives. Help us to, this week, make plans how we can do those things so we can end well when you come or call. And until you do come or call, let us be found faithful. In the name of Jesus, we pray. 